Being a pretty avid gamer, both retro and modern, I do own most of Nintendo's consoles in my collection. From the original NES to the Super Nintendo and GameCube, and the Switch could even be my favourite console of all time. But there is one line that Nintendo fans have been using for the last decade or so, and that is that Nintendo don't compete on specs usually used in defense of their consoles against rabid Xbox and PlayStation fanboys. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, there was a time when Nintendo's new system was the hottest tech in the game and promised to bring a supercomputer into your bedroom. The story of the console that ended up being named the Nintendo 64 is possibly the most interesting of all of Nintendo's systems, and arguably the most hyped and ambitious of the fifth console generation. Now, I first heard about Nintendo's upcoming wonder system by watching UK gaming TV shows in the early 90s, like Games Master and Bad Influence. After the 16-bit consoles started to look a bit long in the tooth, and early fifth-gen systems like the 3DO and Jaguar had started to appear, a big hype began for the upcoming Super Consoles. Details emerged about the very impressive Sony PlayStation and Sega's new console, the Saturn. But Nintendo's new system seemed to be quite mysterious. But what about the other Japanese games giant, Nintendo? Well, there's still no official word about their Super Console, the Ultra 64, although we have managed to track down this rather tatty photograph of it. The Ultra 64 coin-up game Killer Instinct was scheduled to be the first game released with the home machine, but because of the delay, that's been cancelled and replaced by, you'll never guess, yes, Killer Instinct 2. More news about this in November, when the Ultra 64 is finally unveiled to a waiting world at a Japanese computer trade show. The console was codenamed Project Reality. And initially, the only thing we knew about Nintendo's new console was that they were working with the mighty silicon graphics, and the power was going to be out of this world. Silicon graphics were the hottest name in computer-generated imagery in the early 90s, with their high-end systems famously being used for graphics and effects on movies like Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park. Their Reality Engine 3D graphics architecture was made for their high-end Crimson and Onyx supercomputers. Originally designed to be used in digital studios or universities for running simulations, this system could do some, for the time, very impressive effects in real time. For a big price. Seeing the rapidly growing market for 3D video games, SGI wanted to work with a console manufacturer to partner on a high-end new home games console. Originally speaking to Sega, the deal fell through when, according to former Sega of America president Tom Kalinske, it was rejected by Sega of Japan. SGI then went to Nintendo and were met with a much warmer reception, and Project Reality was born. The original hype suggested that Nintendo and SGI were going to perform some kind of miracle and bring the power of the Reality Engine to a home console called the Ultra 64 that would retail for about $250. The demos they showed looked jaw-dropping for the time, but as the console hardware wasn't actually made yet, they were running on Silicon Graphics high-end 3D Onyx multiprocessor workstations. This demo was called Performer Atlantis, and was actually uploaded to the internet as a CD image. And a guy called Banzekin made this video in 2012, showing these videos running on a real Indigo 2 impact machine. I'll put a link to his full video and the ISO file in the video description, just in case you've got a spare SGI workstation lurking in your attic. The Ultra 64 hardware wasn't finished at this stage, but that didn't stop Nintendo demoing it publicly and showing off graphics running on very expensive SGI machines, often running at 1024 by 768 resolution. I actually remember hearing stories of journalists at trade shows checking out these demos, being very impressed, and then looking behind a curtain or under a desk and seeing a $250,000 SGI workstation running the demo. The hype machine was going into overdrive. I even remember reading articles about how the Ultra 64 would essentially be able to render a Toy Story movie in real time. 
Now, despite the demos running on expensive SGI systems, the real Ultra 64 console would run a CPU based on the MIPS R4000 family of high-end workstation CPUs, only needing much less resources, just 0.5 watts of power and costing only $40 to make. The original plan was to have an arcade system based on the technology ready for 1994, with the home console following a year later. One of the first companies who were developing for the Ultra 64 was British game studio Rare. Now, of course, Rare were already familiar with Silicon Graphics hardware, having used them for the stunning pre-rendered graphics in Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo. In fact, at one of our recent panels for our podcast, The Retro Hour, we heard some amusing stories of Rare's time running SGI hardware. I mean, this was one of the incredible things that uh, Chris and Tim, they, they made a real leap of faith and they invested heavily not only in the new the latest software but also the latest hardware all the indies and things that the all the sgi machines silicon graphics that um these machines were hugely expensive and they were quite rare and literally the only place that had more uh, of these machines was Pixar, which were doing a little thing called Toy Story at the time. So whilst they were developing Toy Story, we were doing the um, this the same rendering technique uh, and turning it into video games. And uh, one quite funny story is that uh, at one point the Ministry of Defence had to contact Rare to say, "Why do you have all these these basically supercomputers all what sitting? What is that you're in, building in your in basically car? like a, a bunker?" <laughs> <laughs> a secret lair in the middle of the countryside. Are you planning to try and take over a third world country? And it was going, no, we're actually making video games. Rare produced the 1994 arcade classic Killer Instinct, which proudly boasted it would be available in the home the next year. Unfortunately, due to the console's delay, the game actually was reworked for the Super Nintendo rather than the Ultra 64, and we had to wait until Killer Instinct 2, renamed Killer Instinct Gold on the home system. There were lots of rumours that the arcade was actually running on the Ultra 64 hardware, probably helped by the fact that the logo appeared on the title screen. Unfortunately, the system missed its 1995 release due to technical and catalogue issues. It turned out that Nintendo wanted the problems ironed out and also needed to have a decent range of games available when the system finally went on sale. I remember being a kid in 1995, and back then, when you were at school, a year felt like a hell of a long time, not helped by the fact that 1995 was a huge year for video games. The PlayStation and the Sega Saturn both flooded the market and lots of gamers who had been patiently waiting for the Ultra 64 instead decided to buy one of the available systems. But the hype machine didn't die down and eventually, a year later on June 23rd, 1996, the Ultra 64, now renamed to just Nintendo 64, was launched in Japan. And it was a very impressive system, but it turned out maybe not quite as impressive as we've been led to believe with all of those pre-rendered ultra smooth animations and those logos on those really expensive arcade machines. Another arcade title that claimed to run on the Ultra 64 hardware was Cruising USA by Williams, which when it did eventually arrive on the home system, did look somewhat lower resolution and more limited in lots of places, and was actually pulled from the launch lineup by Nintendo for not meeting their strict quality standards. The reason for this, it turned out, is because the arcade wasn't actually running the same hardware as we eventually got at home. The arcade Ultra 64 system ran on an R4600 CPU, developed by Quantum Effect Design, that was also used in the SGI Indie Workstation. Whereas the N64 had a custom variant of the R4200 CPU that was aimed at the embedded market. Called the VR4300, clocked at a very fast, for the time, 93.75 megahertz. Plus, the Killer Instinct Arcade ran off a hard disk, had a different CPU, didn't have the Reality coprocessor that was present in the home console, and the graphics were actually mostly pre-rendered. Now, admittedly, the N64 console was a very impressive home system and was more capable of 3D than any other console out there at the time, including the PlayStation. 
twinned with the VR4300 CPU, was a custom chip codenamed RCP-NUS, standing for Reality Coprocessor Nintendo Ultra 64. There are actually two processors in the package, which take care of the N64 graphics and audio, including another R4000 based processor, which is where the real power of the console lies. The Reality Coprocessor was developed by SGI and manufactured by NEC using state-of-the-art 350 nanometer CMOS technology, which they just introduced in 1994. It's clocked at 62.5 MHz and contains a whopping 2.6 million transistors. And if you are interested in the full specs and operations of the Reality Coprocessor, there is a great document on dragonminded.com that I'll link to in the video description. Despite the fact that it was a very capable home console, there were some limitations on the system, including a tiny texture cache of just 4 kilobytes. This made life very difficult for developers who wanted to load large high color textures into the rendering engine. And it's partly thanks to this that we get the blurrow vision effect on textures on the N64. But this really was a home console that retailed for just $199 when it was released in America and £250 here in the UK. And while admittedly, it wasn't as powerful as those demos they initially showed that ran on expensive SGI workstations or even the arcade boards, it still was a technical marvel for the price. And it really was a silicon graphics developed machine that you could sit under your TV. And that in itself makes it one of the coolest consoles ever, in my opinion. And if you've enjoyed this video, just a quick heads up that I do a podcast about retro gaming every Friday, available from the retrohour.com or wherever you normally get your podcasts from. Recently, we've done some really interesting episodes, including Bleem, the emulator that brought PlayStation games to the PC and the Dreamcast. We got the inside story with developer Randy Linden and this week, the full story of the company who saw the future too soon, General Magic. And while you're on YouTube, if you've liked this vid, you'll probably enjoy these ones as well. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.